that this world is not our home. This is not really where we belong. God never intended for us to stay here, not eternally anyway. So uh, it's good that we are reminded through song and through the Word. I was sitting at the house this afternoon and I, I counted about 42 people that are missing today. I know some are on vacation, some are in hospitals and things like that. But let's pray for these. And then on the Sunday night when you have those who rarely come back on Sunday nights, it makes the audience seem quite small. I was reading an article the other day, and maybe I read too much, but um, it was interesting that in the Churches of Christ, on Sunday nights, we lose almost 42% of our members. This is the average congregation in the Churches of Christ that doesn't speak too well of us, brethren, when I think about that. It lets me know that we're truly not, and I don't mean anyone in this audience, but I'm talking about we as the church, those who uh, just do not see fit to come back and and whatever, they're really not putting the kingdom first. And I don't say that out of arrogance or haughtiness. It troubles me. It troubles me that uh, they don't consider their soul enough. And, um, and so anyway, it's really, it's really painful. But we need to realize that uh, this, this truly is not our home. This earth is just, uh, uh, we're pilgrims. We're just passing through. And um, we sing a song from time to time, and we talk about this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And the Bible truly backs this up. Now, this is going to be strange to you, but I really hope that uh, maybe you didn't look at your outline as close as uh, I would want you to, because when I finished this outline the other day, I had someone to come in the office, and I forgot to proofread it. And I have found <laughs> several mistakes in the outline. Not that it's going to make a difference in the lesson, but it probably will confuse you as you read it a little bit. But anyway, the Bible bikes up the fact that this, this earth, this earth, this world is not my home. In John 15, 19, Jesus said, again, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But he made sure that he let them know because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And that's definitely true when you stop to think about it. And so it's important we understand this. Peter, again, as I mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 2, he, he lets us be known that we are strangers. We're pilgrims. We're not really in the place we need to be. Uh, and, and, and we're trying to work our way to be and more like Jesus so that someday we will be in that eternal home called heaven. Peter made it clear when he said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Those are mighty powerful words. Mighty powerful. We are, hopefully, we're seeking our eternal home that Jesus has prepared for us that we read about and spoke about in John 14, verses 1 through 3, when Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. He said, If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and where I am, there you will be also, or can be. And so again, that promise is for those who are the children of God. And of course, the seeking that we should be seeking is that eternal home. And so there's some things we need to remember. And first of all, let's not get too comfortable and attached to this world. Amen. It's really important that we don't. This world is going to go away. The things that we have right now, as precious as they may be to us, uh, I would like to think about that the only thing that would be precious to us as world, worldly things would be, of course, naturally our family, but I'm, I'm talking about other than that, would be God's Word. That should be precious to us. The worldly possessions we have, uh, we're to be good stewards of everything that we do have, but they don't really belong to us. God has allowed us to have these things and to enjoy them. But we need to make sure that we don't get too attached to them. Uh, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves attached to this world, and we shouldn't be. Uh, and we'll let this world become a part of our lives in ways that will cause us to not be right with our Lord. 
when Jesus said what he said in John 2, chapter 2 that is, verses 15 through 17, he said, and we, excuse me, when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple. Now think about this for a moment. You may be wondering, why are you using this, these verses? I want you to see something here. Not only were these people doing what they were doing in the temple, but it was wrong. And they were making money out of something they shouldn't be making money out of and from. They were at the wrong place at the wrong time. That's why Jesus said that he, um, he, said that he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money. Jesus poured it out on the ground. And then he said, and overthrew the tables. Now, I will tell you, I don't think Jesus was playing a game with them. It tore his heart up to see how attached they were to this world. As a matter of fact, you know, and, and I will be very frank with you, and this troubles me. You've heard me say it many, many times. When I stand up here and I look out and I see people playing with their cell phones, I don't know what they're doing. I have no clue what they're doing. But, you know, they're so attached to something like that. You go and eat a meal somewhere today, and rarely will you see people talking anymore and, and conversing and visiting. They're too busy on their cell phones, and it just goes on and on and on. We are so attached to worldly things, it's unbelievable. And so here they had become so attached to making money from selling these things, they'd even bring it to the temple where they're supposed to be worshiping God. And yet Jesus said, this is wrong. And so he, he poured out this, he, tore, he turned the table over, and he said to them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. That's something to think about. That is something to think about. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten, listen to him, me up. Whoa. These words are haunting to me. And so when you look at these verses, we need to not get too comfortable with this world and its goods. We need to understand that God has blessed us with so much and he doesn't mind us enjoying the things that we have. That's not the deal. The deal is that that becomes more of our life than being a Christian. And so it's important. We should be, I, I really mean this, we should be torn between desiring to tarry longer here on earth and to, to because for the good of others and trying to reach the lost. Uh, in Matthew 16, we know Jesus said, go into all the world as he did in Matthew 28 and other places. But the thing is, he wants us to go out and reach the lost. But we should be torn as, should I stay here or would it be better if I go on? Paul mentioned that. I've mentioned this sometime back in a sermon in Philippians 1. He said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He was really torn because he said, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I don't know. I don't know what I would really do, he said. But he said, for I am in a strait. And that's, he was hard pressed, he meant. He was hard pressed because between the two, that is either living or dying. Because he said, having a desire to part to be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. These are things we need to think about. I remember reading a story about a preacher and he was publicly praying. And as a matter of fact, he recited the words from Revelation 22, 20, where the prayer, he prayed, even so, come Lord Jesus. Well, during this prayer, there was a lady there, a woman who got up and she walked out. And after the services, he walked out in the foyer and he found her there pacing back and forth. And when he saw or she saw him, she approached the preacher and here's what she said. How dare you to pray such a prayer? If Jesus should come back now, that would mess up all of my plans. <laughs> now, you may think that this really happened, by the way. I know it, who it happened to, a good preacher friend uh, or an acquaintance. Now, I'm not really that, but I, I know it happened. You see, obviously, this woman uh, had misplaced her plans she had uh, evidently, even during that time, was making no plans at all to go to heaven. She was so upset that the man would pray for Jesus to come back that she was so upset that she'd get up and walk out. But she truly was too comfortable, I believe, in the world not meant to be her true home. 
And a lot of us get too comfortable. Also, we need to make sure that we do not get too caught up. Not get too caught up in this world and its things. My oh my. I, I, through my years of preaching, I've heard so many excuses from members of the church uh, as to why they would stop giving as God had prospered them. I've, I've heard several stories told to me by individuals, uh, well, here's why I had to quit giving. It had nothing to do with taking care of family. It never, never did it have anything to do with taking care of other people, but it was taking care of their own wants, their own desires, it wasn't, excuse me, that they necessarily had to have the things they purchased, but that was their desire. So what would they do? They would rob God in order to have what they wanted. That is just so, so wrong. And, um, but we really get caught up. Uh, but I will tell you that if we are not diligent, and I really mean diligent, and if we are not vigilant, and I really mean vigilant, we will find ourselves caught up in a number of matters a number of matters and activities that will really and truly have no, ever have no everlasting value to them. I have known no one that was lying on their deathbed that was concerned about what they had. I have heard of people like that, but personally, I have never met anyone. They could have cared less about those things. Why? Because there was no value in them. None at all at that moment. And so we need to be careful. Let's be careful also not to allow the cares of this world choke the Word of God from us. One of the greatest woes in the church today is the fact that very, and I don't know about, I shouldn't say very few, but there are some in the church today who never, ever open their Bibles. <coughs> Excuse me. They never read the Bible anymore. And I don't mean read, but they're not studying. You know, in 2 Timothy 2.15 Paul was instructing Timothy to study to show himself approved unto God. And someone says, well, that was to Timothy. Can you think of a Christian alive today, any man, woman, or child of God that that wouldn't apply to? Study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. <coughs> Excuse me. Handling aright the word of God. We need to be so careful. Because if not, then we will become unfruitful in the master's use. Matthew 13, verse 22. He also, listen to him, that received seed among the thorns is he that hears the word. Now listen, he hears the word. And the care of this world, the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. What happens? Choke the word. And he becomes unfruitful. These are serious words from our Lord. These are serious matters. And it's something we need to think about. So we really don't want to get caught up in this world and its things. That's for sure. And so let's think about this while we are passing through. Let's make sure of this one thing <clears throat> that matters most to take the presidents of, that should take presidents in our lives. And it's recorded in Philippians chapter 3. When I think about Paul, when he said, when he had said it, I count myself or not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing, listen to him, I do. Forgetting those things. Someone says, well, he was just talking about his past life. I'm sure he was talking about his past life. But I also am convinced that he was talking about anything else. Doesn't matter. He said, I was forgetting those things. But keep this in mind. Please do. Because there's not a single one of us really want to become unfruitful in the master's use. But if we let the cares of this world take us over, then this world and its cares will wipe out, smother out the Word of God in our lives. We'll not see the value of studying. We will not even have a desire to study. We will stop. And there are many today who have, do not attend all the services anymore. They have no intentions to. doesn't matter what I say or anyone else says up there in this pulpit. They're going to do what they're going to do. Why? Because the Word of God has been choked out. The cares of this world means more to them than they will ever admit. This is really sad because their souls are just as precious as mine <clears throat> and as yours. So let's not get too caught up in with this world and its things. By the way, <clears throat> when you think about these things, what's going to happen to them? We all know, don't we? We know what's going to happen to them. 
There's not a single solitary thing that I'm going to take to heaven with me. The only thing that's going to heaven is my spirit. That's it. And that's all that needs to be there, by the way. That's all that needs to be there. That's all that I want there. Someone says, well, I, and I, I want this or I want that. No, you don't. No. Uh, I, I want a beautiful green yard. I don't want a yard. I don't want to have to mow it. I, I just want to be in the presence of God. It just goes on and on and on. We need to understand its importance of these things. And that's why Paul said what he said. And it's very important we understand this. It's very important <clears throat> because if we're not careful, we're going to miss out. And so he's forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. His goal was to make it to heaven. He wasn't going to let things, and he probably didn't have a whole lot anyway. But those things would be worldly things as much as his past. And we need not forget that. And it really troubles me sometimes when I hear members of the church say, well, Paul was just referring, he was only referring to his past life. <clears throat> How could we say that? He didn't say that. I'm not forgetting about my, I'm just forgetting about my past life and that's it. No, no. He said, I am forgetting those things. It's important we understand. Those things which are behind and reaching forth until those things which are before. I press. I press toward, uh, toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. That's so important. We need to see this. Why? Because this world is not my home. <clears throat> it's truly not my home. And I'm telling you the truth. As beautiful as this world is, and as awestruck as I am by some of the things in it, I'm truly glad this is not going to be my eternal place of abode. I'm looking forward to where I don't have to be concerned about corrupt politicians, <coughs> lukewarm Christians, members of the church who will lie and deceive you. It goes on and on and on. I pray for these people. I look for a time when I don't have to be concerned about, am I going to be able to pay this or pay that? I look forward to the time that I will not see young children abused by parents and other people. I won't have to see people sick and dying and hurting and anything else. I have no attachments to this earth. I'm grateful for it. And what God has given us, we should care for it. We are such a blessed people to live in such a beautiful country, but it'll all go away. I was walking yesterday and one of the things that I noticed right off the bat was a beautiful butterfly. Oh my, butterflies are my favorite insect. There are no two butterflies the same, they tell me. <clears throat> Maybe they are, I don't know, it doesn't matter. They're beautiful. But I thought to myself, it was a fluttering around. You'll die soon. You won't even, I mean, probably not many eyes have seen you. But the beauty, that sheer beauty of that butterfly brought me peace. But um, in heaven, that won't be necessary. I love to watch birds. And uh, things like that. But there's a beautiful, the beautiful world God has given us. But let's don't get too attached to it. And then, of course, let's not get too complacent. I struggle with this. Not, and I don't mean this in a self-righteous way, but not so much myself. But I see so many in the church who are just complacent. Really doesn't matter to them if the church grows or doesn't grow. Doesn't matter to them if the church is alive or dead. It's just an, un, an un unfortunate sight. Let's make sure that we do not allow things to take our eyes off the Lord. You see, I have to be careful because people who in the church are complacent, that has an effect on me. Believe me, it does. It really is discouraging to me to see that. And I don't need to be discouraged. Uh, none of us do. <clears throat> But there are those in the church that are just absolutely too complacent. And that's really hurting their soul, of course, but it's also hurting the church. Why? Because they've taken their eyes off of the Lord and other people are noticing that and, and it just goes on and on and on. But in order for us to do so, we must remain zealous in His service. Zealous. There's a man sitting in this audience right now <clears throat> he has told me from time to time, and he really means this. He's not bragging, he's, he, but he, he never meant it to be a brag. But he said, every time I meet people, I try to tell them about my Lord. Every time. I think about that often. Every time I see this person, as a matter of fact, I think about what he has told me. 
Most of them, they don't pay any, there are some laughing at me, but he said, I'm not going to fail to tell them about my Lord. That's what it's all about. You may never get in this pulpit, some of you men. You may never bring a lesson from this pulpit, but that doesn't make you invaluable. You may never teach a class. You may never lead a song. You may never lead a prayer. I don't know. The things you may never do. But you know what? You have a place in God's kingdom. You have, you have your work to do. And so we do it well. We think about Titus. <clears throat> I think about chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Look at what he says. We're talking about the grace of God. He said, for the grace of God that brings salvation. That's a beautiful word, salvation. Hath appeared unto all men. God hasn't left anyone out. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, he tells us how we should live. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Whoa. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. <clears throat> that really sums it up. This world is not my home. I am to be serving God and Christ and in the world. I, I, am, I am a servant. You know, Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. God, when he sent Jesus, knew that Jesus wouldn't be here long. <clears throat> all the things Jesus faced, all the cruelness he faced, all the deceptions that were placed on him, the lies and falseness. Yet for 33 years, he was on this earth, thereabout, and now he's sitting on the right hand throne of God. Someday you and I can leave this place called earth. Someday you and I will leave this place called earth. But what is waiting on us? Well, it's the very thing that I talk about this morning. It's going to be heaven or it's going to be hell. There is no in-between. And so we should be zealous in His service. And let us as members of the Lord's church be about doing that which glorifies Him. <clears throat> many, many times, members, some members of the church want to be patting themselves on the back, talking about all they've done and what they're doing and on and on and on. It's great what they're doing, what they're going to do. But you know, everything that I do, everything I say, every place I go, it should bring honor and glory to God, not me. The glory belongs to God. That's why Jesus said, let your light or your life shine, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's an important statement from Jesus. When we talk about our lives in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31, there, Paul said, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Eating and drinking brings honor and glory. Yes, yes, there it is. It's very important we understand that. But he didn't just say that. He said, all that you do, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Why? Because this world's not my home. <clears throat> I'm just passing through. I am indeed a pilgrim, and so are you. Paul said again, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but listen to him, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. How? With fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. If I had a dollar for every time someone said, I don't attend services because of you, or but it hadn't been for, if it wasn't for you, I would still be there or my this and that. I, I would be a wealthy individual. And probably you would too. But I have never caused anyone not to attend services. No way. And they never, that doesn't make me feel bad when they say that. I feel bad for them that they're so weak and so dishonest and so unfair with themselves that they would say, because of you. Now, if I was a false teacher, if I was an arrogant man, and maybe I have been in some way, and God knows I didn't ever, never intended to be that way. But I try to remind them, listen to me. God requires you to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's unbelievable. When people walked away from Jesus, why would I think that people wouldn't walk away from where I am? Those who do not love Jesus are not going to serve Him. They're not going to stay with Him. 
They're so attached to this world. They're so attached to themselves and all the physical realms of it that Jesus is just a byproduct. And that's so, so sad. So Paul said, yeah, in my presence, I'm grateful you're doing what you're doing and even more in my absence. But he said, you make sure you continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Some do not even fear or tremble anymore. I'm not talking about outside the church. I'm talking about in the church. There is no more fear, no more trembling to them. They are so complacent in where they are that they really don't care what I think, you think, God thinks, or anyone else thinks. That's an unfortunate matter. So unfortunate. There is so much work to be done. So much work placed upon me and placed upon you. And so every turn we make, there's something to do. <clears throat> I think about lost people that need to be saved. What am I doing? What am, what am I doing? I'm not even thinking about you right now, but what am I doing? You know, Jesus made it very clear for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. We find that in Luke 19.10. How many of us, just think about this for a moment, knowing that this world is not our home, we're just passing through, God may end this thing any moment now, it could happen, but how many of us are really trying to reach and, and, and seek out the lost? Really and truly, what are we doing? Well, in many cases, we're too busy about thinking about what am I going to do tomorrow? I made these plans, I made those plans. It's like the lady who was angry at the preacher because he prayed to the Lord. Even so, come Lord Jesus. That would mess up my plans. I don't want him to come. Well, there's people that are lost. We think about righteous living. It needs to be demonstrated, as was read by Cliff a moment ago. Think about what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. He talked about this in such a way that it should grab our attention. And if we're not listening very closely, then we need to. He said, as obedient children. That's very important to get. Those first three words, as obedient children. Now, I believe that we all understand what he says here. Now, he gives a clarification. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. There was a time in my life I was ignorant of the things that I am not ignorant of anymore. And so this reminds me. But then he said, but as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye also holy in what? In all manner of life. In all manner of life. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. These are important words for us. Why? Because, listen, I am not going to be in this world, not, at least for me now, I understand, not many more years. Whether it be in the next two years, two months, two days, two hours, two, it doesn't matter. I just know because of my age and my time in life, I don't have a whole lot of time left. But I want it to make it the best there is. In all manner of life, I want to be holy. I fail. But you know, as a child of God, I can say, God, forgive me. And I know he does. You know, we must be demonstrating our righteousness. The world is looking at us. As a matter of fact, the world knows us better than we think they do. There's an old saying, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. But the one thing we do know, we can't fool God not one time. We can't do it. And he's the one that really counts because he's the one that's going to judge us through his son. But still yet, we need to understand that we're to be living a righteous life. And let's think about this. We cannot become too complacent <clears throat> because we must be growing spiritually. You ever heard someone say, he's a spiritual giant. She's a spiritual giant. They are spiritual giants. There are some people in my life, and there's, some are dead now and gone, but there's still people in my life. I look to them and I, in my estimation, they're spiritual giants. Why? Because they are not too complacent in this world. Why? Because every time you see them, here they are. They're here at every service. They're, they're busy helping other people. They're doing whatever they can for the cause of Christ and to lift up the church and to edify one. It just goes on and on and on. 
What a wonderful, wonderful sight that is. But they're growing, and they're growing spiritually. And Peter tells us to, but, but to grow. He were to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Could we, and I'm probably would say yes, at least for the vast majority of the people in this building. But if someone came to you today and they ask you, could you give me the plan of salvation? I, I mentioned this last week. Could we do it? When I mentioned that last week, what did it mean to you? Did it mean anything at all? Do you even remember me mentioning it? Did it cause you to want to study if you couldn't do it? And can you do it now? I mean, the scripture tells us to be always ready to give an answer. Peter tells us that. Of the hope that lies within us. We're to do it with meekness and with fear. That is reverence. But here he says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to it. To him, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. These are important words for us. It's very important. Why? Because this world is not my home. It's not my home. I'm just passing through. I am a pilgrim. I am a stranger. The world hates me because they hated Jesus. Jesus told me that. I could not get too worked up over what the world thinks. You know, I'm, I'm probably like you. I'm very active in contacting our... our um, and forgive me if you are, are upset with this or offended by it, our so-called leaders today. I'm very disturbed about our leadership in America. And I send emails all the time, and I've been called everything but a, a true American by some of these so-called leaders. But I pray for them at the same time. Uh, and, and, and they don't like me. I'm sure when they get an email from Jimmy Young now, they, they pretty well just throw it in their spam. Maybe I'm even blocked. I don't know. But the whole point is you can only do what you can do. But I don't do it to hurt. I do it to help. I care about this country. I love America as much as anybody. I would die for this country. But I'm sure not pleased with my leadership. I care about the church. I would die for this congregation right here just like you would. But I'm not too excited about some who are complacent. Doesn't mean I don't love them. Doesn't mean I don't care for them. And I know some would probably say, I don't care what he says. I, I can't help that. But you know what? The Bible teaches me to just preach the word. Be in sin and season and out of season. Reprove and rebuke with all long suffering of doctrine. It's important that I understand that and, and not become complacent. So what's the bottom line? This world is not my home. And so let us be about the Father's business as we make our way to our eternal home. It wouldn't trouble me if God brought this world to an end, at least on my part, because I'm tired and I'm ready to go home, aren't you? There's no place like heaven, an eternal rest. No more of anything, no more hypocrisies, no more lies, no more anything, just total peace. I cannot even fathom that. But I want everybody to go. And I, I really believe that uh, that's my eternal destiny is heaven. Because I know God knows my heart. And I know when I sin, I know when I sin. And I ask God to forgive me. And I'll sin again and again. But God is my Holy Father. And I want to be about His business. And I know when I do sin. And when I do repent. I don't have to be concerned about that anymore. I should learn from it and just become stronger. And so as I conclude this evening, the longer we live, the more we see this sin-cursed world. Oh my, the more we see it. And the more each and every one of us should desire to go home and be with our, our Lord eternally. We can enjoy what God has given us. We can truly enjoy, as I stated in the beginning of this sermon, what God has given us here for a while. And that's what he wants us to do is to enjoy them, not to love them, not to get too attached to them, but to enjoy. And that's okay. But let us not get too attached. Why? Because it will all end someday. 
It'll all end. Heaven, the whole, the home, the home, the only true home of the soul awaits us. I want to go home. Don't you? I'm not talking about 1201 Broadmoor. It's going to be okay too because Bill don't call me at no 815 tonight because I plan on being in bed. No, Bill calls me every night at 8 o'clock unless he's been out golfing and he gets beat up and you know who beats him up. But then he pouts for a few days, but then he starts calling again. No, I'm just kidding you. But you know, that, that's the beauty of life. Life is beautiful. What God has given us is something else. But think about what he has planned for us now. He hasn't given it to us yet. But that great reward in heaven. What a beautiful thought. I sure want to be there. But I know I need to understand that this world is not my home. We all need to understand that. And so let's prepare for that place called heaven. That eternal home. And that preparation is an everyday preparation. It isn't just on Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday evening. It's an everyday preparation. Let's get ready for it. Let's make sure that when this old world ends and our life ends that we don't miss heaven. Because if we do, we have missed everything. This evening, if you're not a Christian, you can become one. You can go to heaven. You can be with all the redeemed of all times by simply obeying the gospel, to hear the word, to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, to repent of all of your sins, to make a confession with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, and then to be immersed in this watery grave of baptism, this burial, as Paul says in Colossians 2.12, to have all of your sins washed away. And then as he would state there, and, and Peter stated in Acts 2.47, the Lord will add you to His church. What a wonderful thing. This world is not your home. For those of us that are Christians, let's don't get too tied up with this world. Let's, most of all, don't become too complacent. Um, we just cannot afford to do that. Because if you do become complacent, your, your love for the church will not be what it needs to be. It really won't be. It, your love for your own soul won't be what it needs to be. But you know, God has given us an opportunity to always renew our lives, always renew our uh, affiliation, if you'd allow me to use that word, with Him, to come back home. I remember as a child, I truly remember this out in West Texas. My mother used to stand out on that old back porch and she'd scream out to us children, come home, kiddos, come home. It's supper time. And, and it was, it would be supper time. When we heard that voice, guess what we did? We came home. Went down in that valley where we may be. We, there's no telling what we were doing. But when we heard that voice of hers, we, were, we knew it was time to go home. And the Bible teaches us in many ways, come home. It's supper time. God is gently pleading, come home. Would you do that?